What you're going to get is sort of evolutionary human genetics 101. So the topic is ancestry, and part of that has to do with the fact that thanks to the biotechnology era, there's all kinds of companies out that if you send them a buckle swab and 100 bucks, they'll tell you who you are. Now, hopefully you already know who you are, uh, but we'll get into that later. Uh, a lot of that is very interesting, and I'll give you some data from some of our studies. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the same thing applying to medical genetics, uh, where you, for $200 you can send in a swab, and they'll tell you all the potential diseases you're going to get. And I'll tell you why that's not going to work. So in any case, uh, we can skip this. So when I was going to school, we didn't know how many chromosomes there were, let alone what DNA was, not at a really in-depth level. So this is a picture of DNA. Um, it's actually a very simple compound. So we have s six billion rungs in our ladder. Uh, they're distributed as chromosomes. I'll show you pictures. You get three billion from your mom, and if you're a male, slightly less than that from your dad. If you're a female, you get three billion. So one of the reasons males are at a disadvantage, you can have a ha from the women, uh, is the fact that chromosomally we're not exactly the same. So DNA itself is actually very simple. It's got a sugar, deoxyribose. It's not one we normally eat. It has phosphate and it has nucleic acids, and there are only four of those. So, and it's kind of funny, there's two f classes. There's purines, which are big molecules, and pyrimidines, which are little molecules. And a purine always pairs with a pyrimidine, and adenine always pairs with thymine, and guanine always pairs with <laughs> cytosine. So we'll just quickly go through that. If that doesn't happen, we have a thing called a mutation. And realistically, if mutations occur in coding regions, usually the outcome's not good. Those don't tend to stay around very long. Many of them don't do anything, and I'll talk about those a little later. So I know you're deeply interested in knowing what one of your cells looks like. This is a generalized cell. You can see that thing that says nuclear DNA. That's the nucleus of the cell. That's where all the interesting, well, I shouldn't I have to be careful about that. I have friends who spend all their time looking at mitochondrial DNA. But that's where all your inherited variation comes from. You'll see a thing that says mtDNA. That's mitochondrial. Those mitochondria are basically where all the energy in your body comes from. And so the number of mitochondria you have directly relates in any given cell to how much energy it uses. So your heart muscle cells have lots of mitochondria. Your brain cells have lots of mitochondria. There's a bunch of other cells that don't do much, so they don't have a lot. And all the rest of that you can pretty much ignore for this particular talk. So here's our genome. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, somebody brought up bonobos and chimpanzees. The difference between chimps and humans is they have 24 pairs of chromosomes. One of our pairs, and I don't remember which one, I think it's chromosome 2, is actually the fusion of two chimp chromosomes. So somewhere in the last <clears throat> 10 million years, uh, two of the chromosomes fused together. So those chromosomes add up to approximately 3.2 billion base pairs. In contrast, mitochondrial DNA, which we'll talk about a lot more later, is only 16,000 base pairs. And probably at one point was a parasite. It was a bug that infected us. And so it's more closer to a bacterial genome than a human genome. Uh, humans have different sex chromosomes, and that creates its own set of things. Females have two X's, males have X's and Y's. Just, I know you're totally disinterested, but just a quick thing on what a chromosome looks like. You may see in the literature or on the news something about telomeres. Telomeres, to some extent, determine how long you live. Because the longer your telomere, the longer you're going to live. Telomeric uh, regions are repeat regions, and as you get older, they get shorter and shorter. And so one of the things about aging has to do with that. The 
for some obscure reason, actually it's not very obscure, short arms are called P and long arms are called Q. The reason for that is the guy who discovered what chromosomes look like was French. So anybody know what the French word for little is? Petite, first letter of that's P. Traditionally in nomenclature, if you're naming something else, it follows the next letter, so that's why we have Q. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, so these are what chromosomes look like. Chromosomes actually don't look like this. They look like a log. If you think of uh, making a bowl of pasta, in the nucleus, that's what your chromosomes look like. They just look like long strands. It's only when cells are ready to divide that they start looking like this. And you only get the dark bands when you do some secondary treatments. So if we took all the DNA from one of your cells and place it end to end, It'd be nice if I had a six foot table here, but I don't. But anyway, all of your DNA from one cell is about six feet long. Unfortunately, it's very narrow, so you'd never see it. So one of the things that the Human Genome Project discovered was we had a lot fewer genes than we thought. Originally we thought we had somewhere between 100,000 and 250,000 genes. And this was based on how many proteins we make under the old assumption, one gene, one protein doesn't work that way. Turns out we've only got about 20 or 30,000 genes, but they make over a quarter of a million proteins. So that's an interesting question in itself. What's really interesting is 97 to 98% of our genome we don't think does anything. Now originally it was called junk DNA. Now people are saying no, it probably has a whole bunch of functions. One of the functions it has is to absorb errors because when DNA replicates, on a regular basis it makes mistakes. We'd rather have it making a mistake in something that's not coding for anything, rather than making a mistake in something that does something. Turns out some genes are very susceptible to errors. Any error, and it doesn't work. The good news is, you usually can get by with only one of them defective. Unlike your car, where if you lose a tire it doesn't work all that well, we've got two genes, Usually, if one of them's no good, we can get by with 50% of enzyme activity. We can actually get down to about 25 or 30%, nothing serious happens. You get below that, we start having problems. So, how do we get 20 or 30,000 genes to make a quarter of a million or a million proteins? It turns out there's a thing called multiple splicing strategies. And since I spend most of my career working on antibody molecules, we're gonna talk about antibody molecules. The heavy chain, now, why do you care about antibodies? Because if you didn't have any, you wouldn't have lived this long. One of the things that allowed people to live to the ages we live to and not die of bacterial and viral diseases is we have immunizations. Immunizations takes your body's ability to make an antibody, it gives you an antibody, so we don't get polio anymore. We don't get smallpox, we don't get all kinds of things all kinds of other things. In any case, the antibody producing region, the heavy chains, it's a big molecule. Think of it as a lobster. It's got claws at one end and tail at the other, and the claws are what gives it its specificity, and the tail is what kills the thing it hooks onto. But anyway, it's about 1.25 million base pairs. Um, we have all kinds of things in there. In front of you, you have all the different things that create antibody specificity. We have a whole bunch of things called variable region mark genes, and we have joining genes and diversity genes. And to get a single antibody molecule, your body goes through and pulls out everything but one V region, one JD region, and hooks it onto a constant region. And we have a whole bunch of those too. Now, this is not a human antibody molecule. These are mice because humans are much more complicated than this. But in any case, so your variable region gets spliced onto a couple of constant regions, and ultimately you make an antibody. Now one of the nice things about making antibodies is that once that's in your system, if the antigen ever shows up again, you can keep making it, and it comes back. That's called antibody memory. So here we have a way where one region can make literally a million different antibody proteins which is very good, as long as they're not against you. So, some quick nomenclature. 
That's just, a, <laughs> that's just an educated word for what we call things. So we use the word locus or loci. Loci is plural. It simply comes from the same root as location. A locus is simply a place in your DNA. It's, you can think of it as the address on your street where your house is. Now, the only difference is, in the DNA level, only two people are allowed to live at each locus. So it's a specific location. So we have different ways of doing it. If it actually codes for a protein, it's got the name of the protein. So fibrinogen, which is just a clotting protein, has the abbreviation FGA. So anything that's located in that gene is called FGA. If it's a non-coding region, it has different weird numbers. And I'll just say that because in 1983, when we created the nomenclature system, it seemed very reasonable. The problem is since then, all kinds of other people have jumped in, so we have different names, and they don't necessarily make any sense. So polymorphic just means multiple forms. The general benchmark is if something has a frequency of more than 1%, it's considered to be polymorphic. So, the vast majority of DNA we have, probably 95% of the DNA between all of us is exactly the same. Boring. However, it, somewhere between every 300 and every 3,000 base pairs, there's some kind of genetic variation that occurs. Some of it is very, very old. So some of it we share with our ancestors, like chimpanzees. Some of it's very, very recent. We only share it among humans. So there's all kinds of things. So we have different kinds. We can have things that are just polymorphic, and we can use those to individualize people. And so on the news, when you see somebody was found in a DNA database and a solved the cold case, that's a form of DNA we can use to individualize people. We can have things that are, show ancestry. In other words, markers that are more common in one population than in another, or may only exist in one population. We can have lineage markers. Lineage markers tend to, one, they tend to, one, they are ancestral, but they tend to form discrete lineages. Usually they're inherited in funny ways. So for instance, mitochondrial DNA, you only get from your mother because it's transferred in the egg. On the other hand, Y chromosome DNA is only transmitted to sons. So, and I'll give you some examples of both of those later. So phenotype variation, how many of you have blue eyes? How many of you once upon a time had blonde hair? <laughs> how many of you altered the color of your hair? <laughs> All right, that creates an interesting thing because if you're gonna do a study on hair color, you need to know what the original hair color was. But in any case, we are now, and now can look at uh, the genes that are involved with whether or not you have blue eyes or blonde hair or red hair. Uh, it's kind of interesting because when we started looking at black hair, we discovered that people with black hair in different populations had different genes. So there's all kinds of genes. So we have all kinds of different things we can look at. Remember, the ultimate question is, can we determine your ancestry? So we have now, Back when I went to school, we didn't have DNA markers. We barely knew what DNA was. It wasn't until I was getting out of a postdoc that the first DNA markers were found. So we have all kinds of classes of marker. We have things called single base pair changes. So we've got a billion base pairs, and if we have a polymorphic change in any one of those, that's a single base pair polymorphism. We have big chunks of DNA that are repeated, think of them as sort of freight trains with different numbers of boxcars, and the boxcars are different lengths. We have a funny group called insertion deletions, and those are interesting because they're viral genomes that somehow have gotten incorporated, and they occupy about 40% of our genome. Most of the time they don't do anything. Those were the original ones we had. Lately, people have found new ones. One of them is copy number variation. Copy number variations are, you have the same gene over and over again. Now, all of you have those. So for instance, 
One of them is for a gene called amylase. Amylase is that gene that in your parotid glands, in your mouth, that when you eat a cracker, if you chew on it long enough, it starts getting sweet. And that's because the starch in the cracker gets broken down to sugar. And that's evolved relatively recently because we didn't have a big need for that when all we ate was meat. But when agriculture came along and we started eating more starches, it became more important. There's another one called translocation polymorphisms, which is just big rearrangements. And we don't understand those and nobody's doing a lot of work with them. So, SNPs or the single base pair changes, have, we've used those for a long time. Hopefully some of you know your ABO blood groups. So the ABO blood groups are the oldest common polymorphism tested. They began in 1900 because they allowed for the transfusion of blood. Before that, people knew that if you bled out, you died, but they couldn't really fix it. They tried transfusing blood from person A to person B, but over half the time, the outcome was negative. They even tried doing animal blood into people, and there almost every time the outcome was negative. So that's a simple polymorphism. Uh, enzyme variant. Historically, we did things serologically, and most of those antibodies were made by people because they were immunized by other people. In the 1950s and 60s, electrophoresis came around that's using electric current to separate proteins. So huge amounts of work were done. In the 1980s, DNA technology came along. Actually, the first one was in about 1975. But, and so as DNA technology, as technology has evolved, we found more and more types of markers. So this is an example of an RFLP typing. This is the kind that was done in 1975. This was a test for sickle trait. And trust me, it was very cumbersome because to do an amniocentesis to find out if a fetus was homozygous for sickle, you had to do an ultrasound, take a very long needle, go in, collect blood out of the umbilical cord, separate it out, and test it. So in this particular case, if you have alpha hemoglobin, which is this one down here, you have the sequence GAG. If you have sickle hemoglobin, you have GTG. It turns out that there's a thing called a restriction enzyme that recognizes the GAG and will cut it. When that happens, you get the smaller band. When you don't cut it, you get the bigger band. And so these are called restriction fragment length polymorphisms. That's a, another to our lecture in itself. These are just some examples of VNTRs, the ones we use now, though not in the technology we use now. Big regions recombine, and if you inherit a block, it's called a haplotype or a haplogroup, depending on how many markers they have. So for instance, when I was talking about the immunoglobulin heavy chains, they're inherited in haplotypes because there's a whole bunch of genes there that all have markers. Mitochondrial DNAs and haplotypes or haplogroups. Y chromosomes are, we'll talk more about those later. So, supposedly modern humans evolved about 150,000 years ago. So how many of you have heard of a Neanderthal? Okay, Neanderthals aren't modern humans. And if one was sitting next to in that empty chair, you probably could tell it they didn't quite look right. They look a little brutish. They have a low forehead, teeth stick out, their mouths stick forward. If you give him a shave and put him in a modern clothes, he'd just look a little, not probably somebody you wouldn't want to take to a dance, but walking down the street, you wouldn't notice him. But in any case, those separated from the line that modern humans came from probably about a quarter of a million years ago or later. So. Modern man's been around, probably in a, came from Africa originally and left Africa. Now man's left Africa a bunch of times. So when did man leave Africa? We don't know for sure. We know how old we found the people that left Africa. So we know that people in Australia have been there for at least 60,000 years. So they've been gone a long time. So, Modern humans 
when they left, did not travel in RVs. They did not travel in large groups because basically they were hunting and gathering bands. And so they were in bands of about 30 or 40 people, not very big bands. And so there was a lot of variation, but they had sampling. So if we go to Africa, we see the most genetic variation there. As we go farther and farther from Africa, we see less and less, though it's surprising how much there is. So what happens when you go and you can think about it as a big ball, a big bowl with colored marbles. Let's say you have red and white marbles. If each group goes randomly, grabs a handful of marbles, you're not necessarily going to get 20 red ones and 20 white ones. It'll vary all over the place. And so that kind of variation exists. Genetic drift and selection. Genetic drift has to do with simply sampling error. Doesn't matter whether the gene's good or not. Remember, 90-some percent of our genome is not coding for anything. Therefore, it should not be under any kind of selection. When populations get to environments that can be different, then you can get natural selection. So the biggest example of that, or one of the most classic examples, is the Galapagos Islands. And Charles Darwin was there and saw all the different kinds of birds and iguanas and various other things there. So, if populations are far apart, and we can assume, for instance, that people in Australia probably did not regularly get together with people in India, or certainly not Europe, and certainly all the way back in Africa, which was about 15,000 miles away. So, why not? Well, one of the things is when people were moving out, it was usually because of population pressure. In other words, the area got too full, so they said, well, we better go find someplace else to go hunting or farming or whatever it is we're doing. Remember, they weren't doing a lot of farming then. They were mostly doing hunting and gathering. So by the time they got to Australia, you would have had to go through all the other people to go back. And you would not necessarily have been very welcome. So you're going to get accumulation of mutations. So we're going to have a long history of mutations. We're going to have mutations that started in Africa that we took with us. We're going to have mutations that occurred outside of Africa that a large number of people share. And we're going to have mutations that may only be in a single population. Okay, these are how long haplotypes are. And basically, the farther you are from Africa, the longer the haplotypes because the less time you've had to rearrange them. In other words, people that have stayed in Africa have been rearranging their chromosomes. By the way, just like I didn't mention it, chromosomes rearrange on a regular basis. Every time you make a copy of them, they rearrange. So there's lots of rearrangement going on. So what kind of markers are we interested in? Well, for markers to be informative, one is they have to be polymorphic. And practically, they have to be pretty polymorphic. Because if a marker has a 1% frequency, first of all, you need to have a certain minimum number of people to even find it. So we can have markers that we call ancestral or lineage markers that are identical by descent. That means if, and I'll give you a counterexample, if, how many of you know your blood type? Who's blood type B? See, only a few of us are blood type B. But the fact is, the few of us that are blood type B don't have to be related to each other because there's lots of different blood type Bs and it's been out there for a long, long time. On the other hand, if some of us were sharing, say, Tay-Sachs disease that only Ashkenazic Jews have, there we have ancestry by descent because all of those are the same marker. That mutation occurred probably eight or 900 years ago. So those are the same thing. Mitochondrial DNA is interesting because it has a high mutation rate, it does not have repair enzymes, and it doesn't have recombination. And NRY, which is the Y chromosome, does the same thing. Some women are going to say, yeah, I know. Anyway, so ancestry informative markers are markers that occur in high frequencies in certain populations and in lower frequencies every place else. Now, the ideal 
ancestry informative marker is every population has their own markers. That'd be perfect. Doesn't really exist, but it would be perfect. So examples, one of them is the immunoglobulin heavy chains that I just talked about. Because of disease evolution, many, many, many populations on a worldwide basis have different markers that are unique to them. And they've been adapted. There are all kinds of things. We see beta globin genes. There are CY450. CYP450s are all those enzymes in the liver that help you not get poisoned. The fact is there's all kinds of poisons in our environment. And if we could just eat things and they didn't kill us, that's much better than if we ate them and we fell over dead. Now, there are some things that CYP450s don't work on. So if you ingest strychnine, it's not going to help you a lot. That's created an interesting modern problem because those CYP450s also deactivate anti-cancer agents. And so now, if you're a cancer patient, the odds are they're going to do genetic profiling on you to find out what drugs you're going to respond to and not respond to. Okay, these are just some population-specific markers. GC Chippewa is a, GC is a vitamin D transport protein. It was found in the 50s and it was found to be polymorphic in Chippewa Indians in Minnesota. Except it turns out it's not just in the Chippewa, it's in all kinds of Indians that are related. GC Aborigine was a vitamin D transport protein found to be polymorphic in Australian Aborigines, which was great, except it turns out it's the same thing as one in Africa. Uh, and so what it is is it reflects a marker that left Africa 60,000 years ago. One of the things that's interesting is it's more common in Australia than it is in Africa. Albumin nascopi is found in a different group of Canadian Indians. Factor 13b is a clotting factor. Uh, we found two of them, Alte 1 and Alte 2, in an isolated population in Siberia, and they've never been found anyplace else. Factor 13a cat is found in another uh, Siberian population. Hemoglobin J tongariki is a hemoglobin variant. It isn't like hemoglobin S. It doesn't do anything. It just is that different. Tongariki is an island in the Pacific, and we thought, oh, good, it's only in this population. Turns out it's all over the pop Pacific. So, but these are all population specific. There are lots and lots of them. We have blood groups that only occur in, say, for instance, the Diego blood group only occurs in populations that evolved in uh, Northern Asia. There's all kinds of them. So, the two causes of these types of markers are genetic drift and selection. So hemoglobin S probably existed previous to the introduction of malaria and agriculture into Africa, but agriculture allowed for people to get together, they allowed the mosquitoes to get together, and they allowed for an increase in frequency of malaria. Sickle cell is sort of a drastic way of taking care of that, so it increased in frequency. But the hemoglobin S in Africa is not the same as the hemoglobin S in, say, India. They're different mutations. So they're different kinds. So we have two different things going on simultaneously, drift and selection. All variation comes from mutation. And we have two kinds of it. Well, we have lots of kinds of mutations. As I said, we can have single nucleotide polymorphisms. That's the most common kind but they don't occur very often. Or they do. Depends on how you look at it. If the mutation rate is 10 to the minus 9th nucleotides per year, that means every year you have a mutation somewhere in your genome. Now, the good news is 93% of your genome doesn't seem to do anything. So we're not going to notice it. If it occurs in one of your genes that actually codes for something, it's probably only going to do something if you get two of them together. So usually we don't notice those for a while. We can have repeat unit variations. They actually mutate very quickly. And we can have these insertion deletions and all these other things. They all mutate. They all have rates that are known. Uh, mutations can be divided in two types. We have somatic mutations. Those are mutations that occur anywhere in your body but in your reproductive tract. Some of those are mutations can be associated with cancers. 
a lot of those mutations just sit out there. Though, only those that occur in your reproductive tract, in other words, occur in an egg or in a sperm, have the possibility of being inherited into the next generation. And even then, the likelihood of them staying around isn't very high. It's one over two N. So it depends on how big the population is. So all of the germline mutations are either going to occur in a sperm or in an egg. Let me just talk a little bit about drift. Drift has to do with the fact that as long as populations are small, gene frequencies can fluctuate. And until relatively recently, and that's rel really recently. So for, remember we said modern humans about 150,000 years. Between 150,000 years and 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, they were in very small groups of people wandering around that only interacted with other small groups of people when they got together. Think about Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert or Australian Aborigines, people like that, who lived by hunting and gathering. It wasn't until agriculture that civilization started getting bigger. It wasn't for the last four or 500 years that population densities really started getting bigger. So a lot of the diseases or infectious diseases, things like polio and things, didn't exist before then because they required epidemiological events. So why are people interested in ancestry? Well, we were talking about this earlier. The first reason that people were interested in ancestry are usually aristocracy who are interested in holding on to their own. So there were two classes of people in the Middle Ages. There were the people that had all the land, usually called nobility or aristocrats or something, royals. And then there were all the people that worked on the land, serfs or some other name. So the aristocracy was important who they were related to. The serfs less so. Thanks to the electronic age, we, can, we now have access to all kinds of things, like the ship's log. So for instance, my mother went and looked up the ship's log that my grandparents came over to the United States in 1900 on. You can do that. So, and for 79 bucks, you can go to Ancestry.com and track your ancestry. How many people know where their grandparents came from? How many people care where their grandparents came from? See, for some people, it's very important. Mine came from somewhere in Romania. I don't care where. First of all, they could barely read and write, and they, knew, they were in some place in Romania called Harloi. You can find it in the 1913 Encyclopedia Britannica. You can't find it after that. The other ones came from some place in the Ukraine. So it depends on where and what questions you're asking. So we can look at ancestry in two different ways. We can look at in documentation. Problem with documentation is it only goes back so far. And depends on whether you came from a population that had written church records. So if you were from a population that had written church records, you have a better chance of finding documentation than if you were in a population that had no written church records. So for instance, there were no written church records for Jews. So unless you have a family Bible that's got several generations in it, you're not gonna go back very far. So we can trace my family back to about 1840. The reality is they probably lived in the same place a long time before then, but we can't prove it. On the other hand, if you were Irish, you could probably trace your church records back to, I don't know, 13th century if you're really lucky. Now, African Americans in the United States have a really big problem because basically before the Civil War, there were virtually no records. And so there's a huge gap in trying to track those records. So people have come up with the alternate method, which is using genetic marker information. The problem is the conclusions you can reach from genetic marker information are only as good as the information on the genetic markers. <coughs> so. Everybody knows what GIGO is. Garbage out. It's an old computer term. In other words, what you get out is so as good as what went in. 
So if the markers you're testing are of limited use, the information you're going to get is of limited use. So, as I said, first widely used non-subjective human marker were the ABO blood groups. Millions and millions of people have been tested for them. During World War I, hundreds of thousands of people from all kinds of ethnic groups were tested for the ABO blood groups simply for the purposes of transfusion. So for those of you who don't know, you can give type A blood to type A people, you can give type O blood to type A people, but you can't give O plasma to type A people, that's bad. You can, AB people can get anybody's cells, O people can only get O cells. But that was discovered in World War I. And so it took 40 years to figure out how to preserve blood so we could transfuse it later, so they had a lot of direct transfusion. But you can look at the frequencies of the ABO markers and get some kind of a worldview from that. So this is a, a tree, and all the trees are gonna be calculated exactly the same way. So we get this tree. Um, not terribly useful. We have some anthropological views of how the world goes, and it's fairly certain that Bantu from Africa and Southeast Asians are not closely related to each other, nor pygmies. So this gives us a view, but it gives us a very limited view. There's a lot of noise in this system because in the ABO blood groups, there's been a lot of drift. So for instance, there were, I believe, how many of you, us were type B? One, two, maybe four or five of us. If we had more Asians here, there'd been a lot more because type B gets, is much higher in Asia. On the other hand, Native Americans are almost all type O. Now, is that drift or selection? Don't know. Originally, there were only two blood groups, A and B. Where did O come from? Why do we have O? Well, there's, two th there's theories on that. One is, is that the blood group O evolved when diseases evolved because people who have O have anti-A and anti-B. And guess what else has, anti, has A and B antigens? Bacteria. So it's very possible that the O gene evolved to protect people against bacterial infections. And it's possible that Native Americans have high frequencies of O, not necessarily because of drift, but because it was a selective advantage. We don't know that answer. So ABO blood groups, are useful, but don't tell us much. So before we had DNA, that's basically all the genetic testing that was done probably before the mid-1980s. People have been doing genetic testing since the mid-1950s. So for 30-some years, we did all kinds of testing. We did blood group testing, we did protein testing, we did enzyme testing. We had all kinds of clinical markers. We had uh, human leukocyte antigen markers. Those became very famous and very important in the 60s and the 70s because they allowed for organ transplantation. So we have huge amounts of data. And every couple of years they have workshops and generate more data. So a lot of that was technologically driven. A lot of it was clinically driven. So we can take a whole bunch of DNA, non-DNA markers, and so I'm gonna give you a tree that was generated using 14 different regions and 55 alleles. And we can show who's closely related. So we have this tree. Now, if we go down to the far left, tree makes a lot of sense. You have Bantu, Pygmy, and Bushman, all of which are Africans. You have Europeans, or Indo-Europeans, you have Teutons, Slavs, Jews, and Indians, Sardinia, then you have all kinds of other. So people that are closely led, all clustered together. The top of the tree doesn't make any sense though. If in fact man evolved in Africa, then the oldest branch and the longest depth should come out of Africa. And the others should be more closely related to each other. So, here we've got a bunch of non-DNA markers. Now, these markers weren't sorted by their information content. In other words, 
again, we have a lot of noise in the system. So this is one using the immunoglobulin tree. This is a tree based on the immunoglobulin heavy and light chains. These have undergone selection. These are not just doing drift. So in this one, we actually get a tree that reflects more of an evolutionary picture. You see a deep root to Africa and shorter roots to other places in the world. Africa clusters together. Most of the other places make sense. There's a couple that don't. Like we have Australia and Melanesia close to North American and South American Indians. That's a chance occurrence. So it isn't a perfect tree. Can we get a perfect tree? Sure. I'm not going to show it to you, but it's a DNA tree. So we get, so all I'm doing is pointing out. So if I take these immunoglobulin markers, which you can see have very different alleles in different populations, and I type a bunch of, let's say, Europeans, do they all come out perfectly European? No. Because there's a whole bunch of history that's gone on. Anybody here from Central Europe, ancestrally? Okay, so I don't know when your family came over. I'm assuming it's after the 12th century since nobody came to the New World before the 12th century that we're aware of. But in the 12th century, Central Europe was overrun by a bunch of Central Asians. We had the Mongol hordes. We had Attila the Hun. Hungary is named after the Huns. The Hungarian genome is about 8% Central Asian. So if we go to any place that are Europeans, we very often find non-European markers. If we go into Southern Europe and the Middle East, we find African markers. Why? because there were African slaves there as early as the fourth and fifth century. There was a recent situation where somebody in England was having testing done and they found African markers. And they got, oh, how did that happen? Well, when they went back in the family, it turns out that in the 16th century or 17th century, they'd brought some Africans over. So this can happen. So, does it mean that you have recent admixture? Not necessarily. We have populations, both in the United States on a worldwide basis, that are hybrid populations. Southwest Hispanics are about 45% Native American, about 45% European, and about 10% African. Islands in the Caribbean can be almost anything depending on who they belong to. So for instance, if you go to Jamaica, Anybody been to Jamaica? Okay, so Jamaica originally had an indigenous native population, which the British promptly worked to death. So they kept the women, but they worked the men to death. Then they had to bring labor in, so they brought in Africans. Well, in the 1840s, the slave trade was uh, abolished in England, so they had to bring over somebody else. So they brought over people from India. And then later they brought over people from China. So you have all kinds of people interacting and leaving their genes around. So we can go almost any place on the globe and find remnants of visitors. So for instance, I did a study on the island of Guam and I found African markers. So I says, Africans in Guam, that's interesting. No, it's not. Because after the Civil War, a fair number of African Americans worked in the whaling trade. And the whalers went to places like Guam. I did a study in Newfoundland. And we found a marker that only occurs in Sardinia. The Sardinians have a fishing fleet. So I asked my, at a meeting with one of my Newfoundland colleagues, does the Sardinian fishing fleet ever overwinter? And she said, how did you know about that? <clears throat> they leave souvenirs. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to find a pure human population. So we'll quickly, lineage markers. So we had our autosomal markers, and they recombine on a regular basis. So if we have a group of them, over time, it's going to be harder and harder to track a bunch of them back. In other words, there's a likelihood that you share some of these markers at the rate of a half with your siblings. You have to share absolutely with your parents. 
but going back to your grandparents, it's only a quarter, and going back farther and farther. So it's interesting because if you look at that, theoretically, if you're at the bottom, in 10 or 20 generations, you have a huge number of relatives. But in reality, the world population got smaller and smaller, so that actually says you had more relatives in common. Down below, we have the Y chromosome, which is transmitted only male to male, and the mitochondrial chromosome, which is transmitted by females to all of her children, but only her daughters can transmit it to the next generation. So we've got lots of markers. So this is just a tree. These are estimates. So 130,000 years ago, we were in Africa. We know that man got to uh, Australia somewhere at least 60,000 years ago. Uh, we're not sure when they got to East Asia. Those dates for the Americas are very tentative because we have archaeological sites in South America that are older than that. So you can take these as... This is the mitochondrial map. Now, theoretically, when they did the nomenclature on mitochondria, the oldest ones should have had A, B, and C. But they didn't do that. So you can see L1, L3 in Africa. Those are the oldest lineages. All the others are new lineages that have spun off of that. L3 became M and N and went out. So you can see M in Australia and New Guinea. Actually, those became P and Q. So there's all kinds of them. But what this means is each human population has its own mitochondrial genome. Are they highly polymorphic? Yes and no. My guess is about 45% of you people in this room are haplotype H because that's the most common European one. And some of them, like you've got X in Europe uh, up here, and you have X in American Indians here. They're different Xs. So, so here's a good example of mine. Who knows who the Romanovs are? Who's the Romanovs? They're the last dynasty to rule, rule what, the Russian Empire. They ruled Russia between 1613 and 1917. Right. This is the ones from 1917 who were killed by the Russian army, white army. Uh, the male is Alexis. The female is his wife who is related to, who's, the, who's her mother? Anybody know? Victoria. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria had lots of kids, all of whom married royalty. Queen Victoria also had a mutation in a gene that caused hemophilia. And so a lot, a lot of her daughters transmitted hemophilia to their children. So their bones were found in 1990 in a place called Yekaterinburg and were tested. And the interesting thing about Nicholas is that Nicholas had something called heteroplasmy. Heteroplasmy is when a mutation in mitochondrial DNA, you have two patterns of mitochondrial DNA. And his relative that they tested, Zinnia, I'm not even going to try it, uh, didn't have that. And so the question was, well, is there anybody else we can test to find out if this isn't a mistake? And subsequently, when things quieted down, they dug up uh, Nicholas's uh, brother, Georgi, and it turned out Georgi had the same mutation. So that was one of the interesting things. This is also the first documented case, a published case of heteroplasmy. So this just shows how mitochondrial DNA is transmitted. And our Y markers, the Y chromosome's in it. It's an itty-bitty chromosome. It's part of the smallest chromosome group, as opposed to the X chromosome, which is very large. So the only part that the Y chromosome shares with the X chromosome are the two ends. So it's sort of like an expanded version of mitochondrial. Because the male population genetically is half the female population and there's only one gene, the effective size is a quarter. So there's a lot more drift. So these are just, don't look at the details, you can just see that Y chromosomes vary all over the universe and can be used. This is just another map. So here's probably the most famous Y chromosome study that's been done. It has to do with Thomas Jefferson. And 
East Eston Hemings, who was the child of one of his slaves, of a Jefferson slave. This also shows the Jefferson family pedigree. So Eston Hemings' descendants have the same Y haplotype as Thomas Jefferson. Does that mean that Thomas Jefferson is Eston Hemings' father? Not necessarily. There were all kinds of nephews on the farm at the same time. All that Y chromosomes can show you is they're part of a male lineage. All that mitochondrial DNA can show you is it's part of a female lineage. So those are drawbacks to these. So modern ancestry testing, you can do Ys. It only tells you about your male lineage. You can do mitochondrial. It only tells you about the female lineage. Or you can use nuclear SNPs. The problem is, unless you have really unique ones and huge numbers of them, which gets <coughs> expensive. So in other words, I can put 100,000 of them on a chip. Chip costs 200 bucks. So I can't charge you $95 to test for something that I'm going to lose $100 on or more every time I do it. So here's some problems. Sometimes some of the reports come out and they'll say, oh, you're 90% European, you're 5% Asian, you're 5% African. You don't know what this means. First of all, some of these markers occur in multiple populations. So in other words, I could have an African marker. I haven't had a near African relative in 130,000 years simply because it has a frequency in Africa and it has a frequency in Europeans. So that's all good. How do you really test this? So for those of you who send in your things, let me just give you some data. First of all, you need to know how many loci have been used. You need to know how they statistically determine your results and what their accuracy rate is. So we've under the National Institute of Justice gave us a whole pile of money to actually set up a test battery to do this. And we started out with 103 SNPs. We ultimately came down to a 50 SNP panel. 32 of the SNPs are ancestry informative. And so we tested this. We used a thing called a likelihood ratio, which is basically you taking the probability of its existence in one population versus the probability in another, and you look at the ratio. A, probability, a likelihood ratio of greater than 1,000 says there's a 99.9% likelihood that that's true. So we use that as our cutoff. We did a training session where we used over 1,000 known samples, and then we tested about 130. So if it was less than 1,000, usually meant that one population was the correct population, but we didn't have a high enough statistical probability. An incorrect result said neither population is correct. So what did we find? So among Europeans, so we can consider all those greater than 1,000 as definitive. And you're going to see that we're only right about 77% of the time. We were ambiguous about 20% of the time. We only actually had two errors. Those errors both occurred in African Americans. Uh, mitochondrially wise, both of them had an African mito, and they had sort of African Y chromosomes. Uh, both times they were classified as Hispanics. So what does this mean? This means that you can have it done. If you're part of the group that's greater than 1,000, that's fine. The question is, how many SNPs would it take to have 100% accuracy all pop for all populations? <coughs> we don't know the answer to that. We can tell you that for other markers, it would take probably about two to three times that number of markers. So that would mean typing for 100 SNPs at least at a time to do ancestry. So caveat emptor if you want to find out what your ancestry is. Medical genetics by mail. This has become a big issue. Um, we have lots of genes. Some of them are single trait genes. So if you have uh, 
two BRAC2 genes in your female, you have a 60% likelihood of developing breast cancer. Females go, oh, that's horrible. I have to point out that if you don't have BRAC2, you have an 11% chance of developing breast cancer. That's the overall risk for all females for breast cancer. So there's a five-fold increase. But what's interesting is, even if you're homozygous for it, you only have a 50% risk. And that's through age 85. So we don't know all of these things. We're now starting to find people that are homozygous for cystic fibrosis that don't have cystic fibrosis. Don't understand that. So the reality is, most of the diseases we all fear, cancer, heart disease, are complex disorders. They aren't single gene traits which means they have multiple genes. We don't know what the genes are. We don't know how they interact. Second reality. The American Board of Medical Genetics is the regulatory board for genetic testing for diseases. And they have a very specific protocol for doing this. It involves, involves gen genetic counselors. In other words, if you go to your doctor and say, well, there's a family history of Tay-Sachs disease, and you have a test, they can interpret those results. Normally, there will be a genetic counselor there, and there will be a, a board-certified uh, person from the Board of Medical Genetics. They have now passed a ruling that any regular physician sending off to these certified labs, a request for genetic testing, has to not only do a test for that, but they have to do 50 other tests for things that actually can be diagnosed. Because that's like saying, okay, we know that there's inborn errors of metabolism we can treat, but we're only going to test your newborn child for one of them. When I was a little kid, we did Guthrie tests for about seven diseases. Now it's about 20. And as we find more and more treatable genetic diseases, they get added in. All diagnostic tests in the United States are got rule, controlled by the Food and Drug Administration. They're called medical devices. To have a medical device classified, the lowest level is class one. It's usually done for reagents. You only have to prove specificity. If it's a class two or class three device, you have to prove efficacy and accuracy. The companies doing these haven't provided any information. So in other words, if you send off a thing and they send you back results, it's a pig and a poke. The FDA closed all of them down. They said you can't do that. Until you document that you, in fact, have a certified medical device, you cannot sell medical services. The FDA was created because of quack medicine, because people died from things that were supposedly medicine. The role of the FDA is to make sure those things don't happen. So companies like 23andMe can no longer test people and send them results. So with that, I'm going to say basically any by mail genetic testing should be thought of as suspicious question its accuracy. This is a good organization for that. Uh, definitely, if you're going, to, you have concerns about genetic diseases in your family, go through a geneticist, a medical geneticist. Um, whether you want to know whether or not you might have uh, Asian ancestry, African ancestry, whether you're really Polish or really 100% Irish, that's up to you. But <laughs> Do research on the company that's doing it. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yes, sir. So if a father has two sons, and he has a marker for something like Chippewa, some, so a marker that's peculiar to him, is it possible that one son will inherit it and the other will not inherit it? Yes, because GC Chippewa is a nuclear trait, so he's not, unlikely to have both of them two of them, so he's going to have one, so he's a heterozygote, so they segregate, so one child could have it and one child wouldn't. There's a chance of 50% that that's true. 
is only a chance of 25% that they would both have it. So following that logic then, there, there could be many groups where, for example, people know they originated from a certain area, but they wouldn't have a marker associated with that area because their ancestor didn't inherit that marker. Exactly. So for instance, let's take Altai 1 and 2. Only like 3% of the Altai have 1 and 2. So in the next generation, there could be fewer. Somebody, yes, sir. Okay, I had a your friend. He uh, took the, uh, it was a, a National Geographic test. Yeah. All right, so in other words, uh, and uh, he was a Greek fellow, professor, I've forgotten uh, exactly the subject. But anyway, he, uh, they claimed that uh, he was related to Ashkenazi Jews. Can you do, tell something like that from... Well, first of all, the purpose of the National Geographic study is, in fact, to see what the gen genetic distribution is in people from different ethnic groups. So that's, they're taking data. Secondly, where do Ashkenazic Jews come from? The Mediterranean area. So there are lots of genes that p everybody in the Mediterranean shares. So if you look at them, they reflect their ancestral origins more than, they do not look like the Northern European populations they live with. Um, Almost all of that work is done by the Max Planck Institute uh, using um, 454 and different second generation sequencing platforms. And the problem is what you need to have like 50 fold sequencing so you can get enough overlap so you can put regions together. It does not work on the random repeats I talked about, the VNTRs. It only works on SNP markers. And you can get enough information to get genomes. So they've gotten several prehistoric genomes. Um, and you can, if you look at those, you can get certain amounts of information. Um, that was w how they managed to report out that they thought the some of the Neanderthals had red hair. You mentioned the National Geographic study. Uh, would you contrast that with the uh, Ancestry.com or 23andMe? Is there a different type of aspect to that? Uh, the National NGO study is basically data collection, which is interesting because they're starting from scratch when there's probably almost a million samples that have already been collected from all over the world that could be tested as well. Uh, Ancestry.com and 23andMe, of course, are for-profit companies. Uh, Ancestry.com um, is largely uh, document searches, but there is a genetic thing. Uh, you can actually read, a ch read their chapter in a book that's coming out in January. Uh, my question is, beside the um, interpretation that they offer, how accurate is their technology in terms of how accurately are they reading the uh, SNPs? Without knowing what the SNPs are, it's a hard question to answer. In other words, unless you know what the variation is among all the world's populations, you can't answer that question. In other words, when we did this NIJ study, we were looking at seven world populations, mostly those representing... I talking about the specific, the actual technology. Right. The technology. Well, the technology is accurate. In other words, can we accurately determine a SNP? Yes. They provide raw data, and I'm asking, uh, is that raw data accurate? I would assume the raw data is accurate. You then have to go look up at either Yale's site and, and Alfred or some other site, all the information about those particular SNPs if they identify them. Yes, sir. We know where Neanderthals came from in their relationship to Homo erectus. Well, there, there, are, there are two groups of people historically in anthropology. We have lumpers and splitters. The lumpers say everybody's related to each other. So the group before Neanderthals are theoretically Homo erectus. Homo erectus, as far as we know, were the first group to leave Africa. They left Africa about a million and a half years ago. Um, we're... Did Homo erectus 
and Neanderthals have a common ancestor, we don't know because we've never done any DNA sequencing on any Homo erectus. So there's, there's two groups of non-humans that have been sequenced. One are a group called Denisovans, who were originally found in Siberia, who probably didn't originally live there, uh, and Neanderthals. And then the other group is Cro-Magnon, which is a modern human that dates to about the same time as the last Neanderthals. Can you speak to why older areas have more genetic diversity, like Africa? Sure. People have been there longer. So recombination is time-related. So the longer you've been in one place, the more rearrangements can take place. The less time you've been in one place, the less there is. And if there's been a selective sweep, it tends to fix a region. So for instance, let's say we're talking about a beta-globin gene. Uh, a beta globin gene that's undergone selection is going to have much less recombination than one that's not selected for. Is that in comparison to um, an entire population, or is it um, just that there's um, less diversity in, a, in an area because there was less numbers of people there? I would say individually, could there be more variation from individual to individual in Africa than there would be in, say, Europe? Yes. In other words, if I look at Bushmen, which have a very low density population, they still have a huge amount of genetic variation on an individual basis. <coughs> now, to reverse that, the cheetahs, which live in the same area of Africa that the Bushmen went through some kind of evolutionary bottleneck in the last 700 years, and they have almost no genetic variation. Any more questions? I have one question. Um, right now, uh, I, I wrote a popular little book on iron. And what I came across was that there was a, a, a growth of a genetic disease called hemochromatosis. Most people remember the movie The Madness of King George. And so I was giving some lectures as I was writing the book, testing it out, the chapters. And the surprising thing to me was people in this Learning and Retirement Institute class, four of them had hemochromatosis, which I then did a little research on with the Hemochromatosis Foundation and was told that the fact was, and I didn't really believe it, so I'm testing it out with you, that the Vikings, because the Vikings had no source of iron in the soil so they could eat and get enough iron to uh, make their hemoglobin, uh, you know, keep it up, that the Vikings had a genetic disease which caused them to store up more iron than was most people. So there's been this I've been told then that this gene comes down through the Celtic population of causing hemochromatosis. So I don't know if you heard about the whole he hemochromatosis rumor, but it was surprising to me the numbers of people in the class who had hemochromatosis, and it was very difficult to diagnose. So uh, I had been told it came down through the Celtic population. One, I've never heard it associated with Celtics. Two, it's extremely easy to diagnose. Three, it's very easy to treat, and four is, is extremely common. The, the last model I heard of the rise of hemochromatosis is it was a response to the Black Plague. Oh, really? I hadn't heard that one. Thank you. Because all bacteria require iron. Yeah. And the plague, plague bacillus goes into macrophages. People with hemochromatosis do not have iron inside their cells. They have it in their serum. So people who have hemochromatosis are protected against bacterial infection. Yeah, I was wondering, um, you know, the recent, or the most recent thing that I've read on it uh, would indicate that, you know, the Neanderthal genes that are in modern human populations are the genes that have been interpreted as Neanderthal genes in modern human populations uh, tend to vary fairly consistently in terms of geographic regions. Uh, as in, Europeans tend to have, you know, certain sets of genes that are associated with Neanderthal ancestry, and uh, 
you know, samples from China tended to have different sets. I was wondering whether that would more feasibly be associated with a uh, model of widespread low levels of interbreeding over the uh, overlapping periods, or whether that would be associated with a single period and then expansion from there of uh, people with some introgressed DNA. That's a really good question. The problem is with the way that because of the Neanderthal genome is highly fra fractured, fragmented, what you cannot differentiate is was that genes that were shared when we had a period of a common ancestor that has been passed down or is this recent admixture? Because the models that have tried to look at recent admixture can't show any, don't show any. So the question is, so for instance, GC1A1 is found in Australian Aborigines and Papuans as well as in Africa, uh, but in, in not in any other human population. So the question is, does that mean there's recent gene flow between Africa and pa Australia? No. It simply means it was a gene that got transferred when those people left. We have no mathematically reasonable or scientific way of differentiating a common ancestral gene from recent admixture. And the way you have to do that is by looking at the linkage region. If it's a very large linkage region, it's recent. But the problem is we can't do LD past 100,000 years. So we have no way of doing it with Neanderthals or any of those. So it's, it's an inanswerable question uh, that I have lots of fun with my colleagues about. So did we have gene flow with uh, Neanderthals 30,000 years ago? I mean, it's worse than that because if you look at the Denisovans, people in Papua New Guinea have about 8% of their genome Denisovan. And so the question is, Oh, so 60,000 years ago when they, and the Denisovans don't exist in Southeast Asia, they've only been found in Siberia. There's no indication that Papuans ever were in Siberia, that they took the coastal route out to Oceania. So the question is, okay, how'd they do that? <coughs> so it's a very difficult question to answer, and there's no way of testing it. Thank you very much. We'll go next